Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm very excited today because we have got an absolutely fantastic podcast for you guys. We have with us Frederick Logavall, who is a professor of international affairs and history at Harvard University. He also won the Pulitzer Prize for history for his book, Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam. But we're not here to talk about that today. We're actually here to talk about his new book, JFK, Volume 1, 1917 to 1956. Welcome. I'm delighted to be with you. I am so excited. I've, I've really, I have to say this, this book is, even though it's so big, it is so well written. And I just, I read it with ease and I love it. And I really hope you guys go and grab yourself a copy right now because, yeah, I, I can't shout praises high enough for this book. <laughs> Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. <clears throat> but we're here to talk about JFK because we're not going to talk about JFK in his time as president, are we? We're going to be talking about what made him, what, how he got there. Yeah, that's right. And, and one of the reasons this became a two volume project. So I'm working now on the second volume, but it became two volumes precisely for that reason. I decided that the early years before, you know, the years in which he's still finding his way, he's, he's figuring out who he wants to be. He's part of this large uh, Irish Catholic family. I decided that we needed to spend serious time looking at those years. And that's what, in part, this first volume does. Right. Okay. Well, you've just mentioned this family. I think we should kick off with that question. So can you tell us about his family and where did they come from? So it's a, um, as I said, it's a large family. Um, They're from Boston. And uh, in the middle of the 19th century, both his, uh, both the relatives on his father's side and his mother's side, so the Kennedys and the Fitzgeralds, came to the United States and to Boston from Ireland because of the terrible Irish famine, the potato famine that occurred. Uh, and so they both arrive, uh, and the early part of the book traces their experiences in Boston uh, they faced a lot of discrimination on both sides. And then they come together. Joe Kennedy marries Rose Fitzgerald uh, in 1913. And that becomes the Kennedy family that we know. And over time, actually in relatively short order, Joe Kennedy makes a lot of money. He's a very savvy investor, both in stocks and in real estate and in, uh, in Hollywood um, and uh, he and Rose have nine children, and the second uh, oldest of those um, children is the one we know as the 35th president of the United States, that is to say Jack Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, and so that's, that's this, uh, this large uh, Irish Catholic family. So I've got a question, shall we through this podcast call him Jack or John? Well, everybody knew him as Jack, uh, and so probably uh, I think we should do that. Uh, and uh, it's, it's actually kind of an interesting little thing is that at one point, I think in the early 50s, so he's now a politician, he's in the House of Representatives, uh, I found a letter in which his father says to him, you know, you maybe should just be known as Jack Kennedy, period. In other words, even in uh, writings, even as a politician, maybe you should not be John F. Kennedy, you should be Jack Kennedy. And I think uh, his son probably made the smart move in saying, no, I'm going to be John F. Kennedy. But of course, everybody knew him as Jack, so we can call him Jack. Okay, so what was Jack's early life like? Uh, I'm sorry, say that one more time. What was Jack's early life like? Well, so he was a sickly child. I mean, that's maybe the first thing we should note about him. Um, he, he looked, you know, healthy as could be when he was born. Um, but in short order began to have one ailment after another. Many of them were ill-diagnosed. I tried in my research to figure out what's actually going on at this particular point or at that particular point. Quite often it was hard, but the point is he was in the infirmary a lot when he was at school, uh, at university, and one consequence of that, which I think had long, you know, long-term implications, is that he became a reader. Uh, there wasn't much else to do when you were in bed in those days. Um, so he became passionate about history, biography, reading about especially European, maybe and maybe in particular British uh, history and statecraft. 
uh, and developed a kind of historical sensibility and an international sensibility that I suggest in the book, uh, he really carried with him always. And so that's, that's one facet of his early life. And of course, there's also what I already said, which is that the family becomes very wealthy. Um, he therefore has opportunities that other uh, young uh, kids don't have. He goes off to prep school. He then goes to Harvard. Uh, and it's fair to say benefits as a young person from the fact that his father uh, has amassed this fortune. Um, but we should, we should bear in mind, as I say, the, the, the ill health that he also suffered, because I think it, it affected him in various ways. So he's a privileged child. We could, yes. say, we could say privileged. Yeah. What kind of education did he receive? So, you know, he, he was well, he was well educated. Uh, and I think it's also fair to say, I'm not sure I've ever put it this way before, but he was also in to, to a degree self-educated, um, which is one of the, one of the things that his friends remarked upon was that really alone among his classmates, he read the New York times every day, you know, cover to cover. Um, so he was, he was curious about the world. As I said earlier, he read a lot, but in terms of his formal education, um, he went through a number of different schools. Uh, the most important two schools are his prep school, which was Choate. So he was there uh, in his teens. And I write quite a lot about the Choate experience that's in Connecticut. It's a boarding school uh, on the British kind of uh, model, if you will. Um, and he wasn't a particularly diligent student. He was a bit of a slacker, frankly, at Choate. But his teachers could see that he had real promise and that when he applied himself, he really could do uh, terrific things. Among other things, he was, they could see a very good writer. He had a great vocabulary and he knew how to express himself on the written page. Um, and then maybe even more important, I argue in the book was Harvard. So this was his undergraduate experience. Um, he, be, he had one year at Princeton, but because of ill health, um, he basically dropped out. And so he started again the following year, 1936, uh, and graduates in 1940 from Harvard, very important phase of his life. Uh, and in fact, his senior thesis, which was about British appeasement policy, maybe we'll talk about this, um, was published as a book. Uh, and that's unusual for an undergraduate to, to, to have a book soon after graduation. He had the uh, the pick of the bunch, really, didn't he? He got into both Harvard and Princeton. Yeah, no, he he did. It's fair to say that in those days, it maybe didn't mean quite as much as it does today in the sense that it wasn't quite as competitive. And if you had the right prep school diploma, it wasn't automatic by any means. Uh, in fact, he tested quite well in terms of the admissions tests for both of these universities. But, um, you know, a pretty high percentage of the Choate students got into one of the so-called Ivy League schools. Um, but yes, he got into Princeton, went there first, as I said, and then uh, switched over to Harvard um, and um, began to become um, a serious student, a serious um, observer of international affairs. That's one reason I think that this period is so important, in addition to the fact of, that, of course, the war clouds are gathering both in Europe and in Asia precisely when he is uh, getting his undergraduate education. So going back, just one step back, just a little bit of a step. Yeah. He ends up going to London uh, before mm -hmm. he goes to college, doesn't he? Yes. I mean, one of the things that's, I, I didn't know this when I started the research and, you know, it's wonderful when you're a historian or a biographer and you have these eureka moments when you're in the archives and you're, you know, going through boxes and you begin to piece things together. And I saw that with his family in 1935, so immediately upon his graduation from Choate, uh, he and his closest sibling, uh, Kathleen, who was known as Kick, travel, um, to England with their parents. And it's the beginning of, I think it's fair to say, a lifelong fascination with attraction to Britain. He was a real Anglophile, which is quite interesting given that he was Irish Catholic. Uh, 
and the Irish often don't have a particular love for England, but Jack Kennedy did. Uh, and I think this initial trip in 1935 is then followed by more extended trips in the years to come. Um, and so he spends a lot of time in England, both then and later, and then also in the, on the continent, uh, in the European continent. And it's a very formative time for him. Um, but I think this initial trip helps to establish this uh, close connection, if you will, with, with, uh, with Britain. I find it so interesting that he is in Europe when all of these things are happening yeah. uh, in Germany and all of these events in the 1930s. Yeah, he's, it's, he's almost like, um, uh, if you're familiar with the Woody Allen movie, he's, like a, he's a Zelig type figure in the sense that he pops up, as you say, in so many places that turn out to be of great consequence. And so maybe most strikingly, is, and I, this is um, the, the better part of a chapter in my book, is that in 1939, right on the eve of war, here is this skinny young John F. Kennedy uh, tooling around uh, the European capitals. He's in Berlin, Berlin in August, late August of 1939. So just as the German uh, forces are uh, moving towards Poland and the war will begin, of course, on September 1st, he's there in Berlin observing the scene uh, writing about what he sees, but it's it's um, it's one example of a number of places that he sees, as you say, uh, in these dramatic uh, times. And I suggest that he's in some ways the most well prepared um, young man in terms of future elective office um, that we've seen uh, in a long time, uh, certainly among presidents. And um, it's a very important part of the. The story, no question. We should also note, of course, that his father at this point is ambassador to England. Uh, Joe Kennedy has become ambassador. He's there from 38 to 40. It ends up being a disastrous uh, ambassadorship, I think it's fair to say. But the reason it matters here in part is because he is the one who, because of his contacts as a, as a diplomat, he's able to make the connections for Jack and his older brother, Joe Jr., who they, they often travel, travel separately, but both both of them are able to go to these European capitals, see a lot of important people, because Joe Kennedy Sr. paves the way for them. You just mentioned uh, his, where, where his father was at that time, yeah. because he then, he destroys his own career, and uh, nearly jacks as well, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, it's such, um, I don't know, it's a cinematic uh, kind of drama in some ways, that this very wealthy American, who has his own, by the way, aspirations for the presidency. Uh, to, a, to an extent that I didn't realize when I started my research, it's clear that Joe Kennedy wanted to be the first uh, Irish Catholic uh, president, and his son ended up, of course, getting that uh, honor. But Joe himself wanted, especially if FDR did not, if Franklin Roosevelt didn't run for a third term, in 1940, Joe Kennedy thought he could be the nominee for the Democratic Party, which was always probably a bit far-fetched, but it was a serious ambition. As you say, he, he, he becomes the ambassador. He initially does quite well, but it ends terribly. He is alienated from his own U.S. government. Roosevelt doesn't trust him. He doesn't trust Roosevelt. He's also initially a big supporter of and um, associate of Neville Chamberlain. But that relationship sours after the war begins um, uh, because Joe Kennedy remains a firm advocate of appeasement even after the war begins. He wants to make a deal with Hitler. Chamberlain has now decided we're not going to do that. And then maybe most interesting, interestingly in some ways, Joe Kennedy has a poor relationship with Winston Churchill, uh, whereas his young son, Jack Kennedy, has a deep admiration for Churchill that he will, I think, carry with him, you know, for all of his days. But it's a, it's an epic story, this, this story of Joe Kennedy as ambassador. I find that so interesting that he had this deep admiration for Churchill. Yeah. Yeah, I think it had, it had something to do with, you know, Jack Kennedy had a sense of the romantic and, 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 and the, uh, 
a, a feel for the intangibles in human affairs, which of course Churchill had. And Joe Kennedy, his father, did not have that sort of romantic sensibility at all. So that's part of it. Part of it also is that Jack, because he was sick so much as a kid, read a lot and he read Churchill. He read Churchill's multi-volume history of the First World War, for example, even as a teenager, and came away, you know, mesmerized. So it was partly that, that he was attracted to Churchill as a writer and a historian. Um, and then maybe finally, what he admired also in Churchill was his speech making. Um, when Jack Kennedy became a senator, and then when he became U.S. president, he actually studied Churchill's speeches studied them for the kind of cadences, for the rhythm of the speeches, studied them for the actual language that Churchill used in these speeches, and tried on some level to, I think, emulate Churchill as, a, as an orator. So there are lots of, I think, bases for this admiration, but you're so right. It's a, it's a fascinating part of this um, young, emerging Kennedy as, as, as a thinker and a politician. That makes complete sense to why he is the kind of president that he is. He studied Churchill, that these pieces are all starting to fit. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I you know, one can probably draw that connection too close. Um, but, but you know, and it was mostly, by the way, one way, um, at least through the end of this first volume. It may change as I do research for volume two. But I don't see a lot of comments from Churchill about the young JFK. Um, a couple of times when he's sick, Churchill says to Joe Sr., you know, my best wishes to your son on his recovery. Uh, he also gets a copy, does Churchill, of Jack Kennedy's first book, Why England Slept. And he's grateful for that book. Uh, and I think even says that he admires the book. So there we have a few scattered references to his view of this, this whippersnapper. But... Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that it's not too much to say that JFK, as he rises in politics, wants on some level to be a kind of Churchill, um, a Churchillian figure, I guess we could say, on the American political scene. So Jack actually participates um, in the Second World War, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. And, you know, it's an interesting part of the story in that his father is so determined to keep his sons out of harm's way. As I said before, Joe Kennedy is opposed to the war. He wants to keep the United States out of the war, in part because he wants to keep his sons out of the war. Uh, he's a very devoted father. He cares a lot about his kids, whatever else we may say about Joe Kennedy. He, he, he's deeply committed to his children wants Joe Jr. and Jack to, to, to be safe uh, and so wants to keep the U.S. out of the war. Meanwhile, his sons, both of them, both of these older two sons, end, end up serving in combat. Uh, and, um, of course, Joe Jr. doesn't make it back alive. He's killed in 1944. Jack has a... Um, uh, an extraordinary experience in the South Pacific. So he serves in the Pacific War in the Navy. Uh, and in 1943, he's the skipper of a, of a torpedo boat, PT-109, that is rammed by a Japanese destroyer in the depth of night. Uh, the boat ultimately sinks, that is to say Jack's boat. But thank, thanks in part to his own, his own quick thinking and I would say heroic actions, He's able to save himself and most of the crew in the days that follow. And this becomes, you know, headline news in the United States. Uh, it becomes, this is the son of the ambassador after all. Uh, and later on, as he becomes a politician, there's no, there's no question that the PT-109 experience was used quite shrewdly by the Kennedys to advance, to help advance uh, his career, but that's getting ahead of the story. It's, it's true, as you say, that he serves in the war, serves with distinction, um, and then comes back uh, in early 1944 from, uh, from the conflict. Am I right in saying that Joe Kennedy wanted, Joe Jr. 
to follow in his footsteps rather than Jack? Yeah, I think Joe Jr. was the, he was the golden child. Um, both Joe and Rose, both of the parents saw him as the one who was destined for greatness. He was the oldest. He was, uh, as, he, as he grew up, he became very handsome, very strong, very ebullient. Uh, you know, he had a lot of charisma. Um, and that's what they saw. And they, they believed all the way through, really until his death, that, as you say, he was going to be the one that, that uh, rose to, 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 to prominence. And Jack sort of was in his shadow. I write quite a lot about this in the book. It's, I think, a, a fascinating sibling relationship and parental relationship in terms of Jack vis-a-vis -vis his parents. He was in his brother's shadow. It wasn't altogether a bad thing because it allowed him to cultivate this more sort of intellectual side uh, he was the more introspective one of the two. He had this romantic sensibility, as I said before. But he also chafed against the fact that Joe Jr. was the, uh, you know, was number one. Uh, and so he, he struggled to some degree also with that fact. But um, until, until Joe's death in 1944, he was the one who was supposed to, to reach the top, as it were. Joe Jr. obviously has now been killed during the Second World yeah. War. So Jack is probably now, he's the number one son. Yeah. When does Joe Kennedy decide that Jack will restore the Kennedy name? And because this starts a whole new career for him post-war, doesn't it? It does. Yes, it does. Um, in a sense. Uh, I'll qualify maybe uh, a bit, but but I think in, I think... You know, obviously he's shattered in 1944. In August of 1944, when Joe is killed, the father is completely bereft. Uh, nobody's ever seen him uh, respond to anything the way he responds when his son is killed. And so for several weeks, he's basically comatose. I mean, he can't do anything. I think when he begins then to say, this was one of his mantras to his kids, life is for the living. When he begins to try to live up to that mantra, I think he decides in pretty short order. So in the latter, certainly in the latter part of 44, Jack is now going to take on this responsibility. My own political career basically has been shattered because of the ambassadorship. Joe has been killed. It's now up to Jack. The only qualification I would toss in is that it wasn't just about Joe saying, Jack, you're it. Um, I think I have pretty good evidence, which I show in the book, that Jack, for his own reasons, long before Joe's death, Jack was interested in a political career, uh, talked about it with girlfriends. Uh, he, in some ways, was, by 1944, by the time of Joe's death, you could argue that it was Jack who was actually better positioned for a for political success uh, we don't know what would have happened obviously if joe had come back uh, maybe jack would have felt like he needed to take a second place i have a feeling however that at some point jack kennedy himself would have entered politics even if his brother had sort of led the way um so that's that's why we have to also bear in mind that jack had his own reasons for going into politics a vacancy then opens up on the 11th district in the fall of 1946. Yes. We're slightly moving forward a little, a little bit here. Yeah. In the midterm election, what happens there? Well, it's as you say, a, a, a vacancy opens up. It's possible, I couldn't get definitive word on this, but it's possible that Joe Kennedy helped make this happen um, by convincing the fellow who held the seat to instead come back to Boston and be mayor uh, because he wanted Jack to have this 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 opportunity. Whatever the case there, it is true that in the 11th, 11th district uh, in Massachusetts, which includes where I'm sitting today, which is Cambridge, it includes much of Boston, um, there is this opportunity. And Jack Kennedy decides with his father's encouragement and his mother's to go for it. Uh, so this is now to be a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. He's 29 years old. He's frail partly because of his war experience, he came back really uh, emaciated, um, not feeling good, 
Turns out he's got Addison's disease, which a British doctor will actually formally diagnose in 1947, so a year later. But notwithstanding these health problems, he's got a bad back. He runs for the House seat. The, the big task here, of course, is to win the Democratic nomination, because whoever is the Democratic nominee will have an easy time in the general election against the Republican, because it's because of the nature of the district. But he wins that Democratic, Democratic nomination um, and shows, this is what's interesting about it, he shows even now, as a 29-year-old, he shows a certain charisma, a kind of magnetism, even though he's quite reserved. He's not the sort of stereotypical ebullient politician. He shows something that I think connects him to voters. We can see it already here, and we will, of course, see it all the way through 1960, the presidential election. Um, and it's on display already here in 46. And of course, then to end the story, he wins this election, first the nomination battle, then he wins easily in the fall, and he becomes, uh, be shortly before he turns 30, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, 1947. What does he do in those six years? Do we know? He doesn't do a heck of a lot uh, in the sense that he's not a very active member of the House. I think he sees the House of Representatives as a kind of stepping stone, uh, meaning I think he's probably looking at the Senate from a pretty early moment, uh, or maybe the governorship of Massachusetts. That's another possibility. So we can't say that he's a particularly uh, diligent uh, con congressman. On the other hand, he shows an interest in those six years, a deep interest in foreign policy in particular, becomes respected in the House for his uh, expertise, or at least his knowledge in that area. And let's remember, he's got not only his World War II, World War II service, but he's got this book, Why England Slept, uh, on foreign policy. So he brings certain credentials to this endeavor. And so I think it's an interesting period, actually, not only because, of course, it ultimately leads then to the Senate race and to him moving up in politics, um, but he's honing his skills as a speaker, uh, as an orator, again, in part on Churchill's sort of exa example, he is honing his, his, um, his uh, uh, expertise in foreign affairs in particular, um, and he easily wins re-election. So he's also helping his district, the voters in the 11th district, like what they see in the young, in the young Kennedy. My next question, um, the world is fascinated with this woman. Um, mm. So much information out there for so many photographs because she becomes an absolute icon. But yeah. while he is a congressman, he does meet Jackie mm -hmm. Lee. Um, <laughs> now I'm going to pronounce her, I always pronounce her surname wrong, so I do apologise. Uh, Beauvoir, is that correct? Uh, Bouvier, I think is how Bouvier. she would pronounce it. Yeah. Um, so my question is, how do they meet and... Yeah. Let's start with that one. How did they meet? Well, so they are, um, there's a, a journalist, uh, Charles Bartlett, and his wife, Martha, are quite determined to get these two young people together, because they know them both. Uh, and they think that Jack and Jackie <clears throat> would make a great couple. And so in 1951, so he is, as you say, a member of the house, uh, in 1951, in the spring, they have a dinner party in Georgetown, uh, part of Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, the two of them are there. Uh, they meet. Uh, it's unclear exactly how many words are exchanged. I think it's a fairly large dinner party. There are others present. Nothing really comes of it. Um, um, and what happens is that a year later, almost exactly a year later, another dinner party at the same place, at the Bartlett's. In other words, they are quite persistent. So they try again in the spring of 52 to get these two together. This time it works. So they begin to date. He has a Senate campaign. So this is the, this is the year in which he runs and wins an epic battle against Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., a very formidable Republican. People thought, you're crazy to take on Lodge. 
but he did and he won even though it was a republican year in which dwight eisenhower you know sweeps into the white house kennedy beats lodge but it means because he's a very diligent he was a very hard-working campaigner um, that there's not a lot of time for courting Jackie or for, for them to see each other. So they, they, uh, they date, he calls her a lot, you know, using coins in the, in the, in the, in the phone booth, uh, clinking of coins to call her from various parts of the campaign trail so they can speak on the phone. And then after he wins this election, uh, it becomes much more serious and the relationship really you know, gels in late 52 and for the first uh, six months of 53. And then they become engaged uh, and ultimately married in September of 1953. My question is, when they get married in September 53, was it a happy marriage? Yes and no. Um, I think that... um, there was genuine affection. Uh, and I think they were, I, I talk about this when I describe their initial encounters, their early meetings, the things that they liked about one another. And those were, those were real and they had a lot in common. They were also very different in other respects. Uh, but uh, I think there was a lot about her that he loved and vice versa from the time that they first met, as I said. And I think there were good times in, in, in the early days of their marriage, and there were difficulties. Uh, neither one had ever lived with somebody else. And so there was that adjustment. He was 12 years older than she was. So that had a certain effect, I think, on the early months. Most important, he was a, he was a, he was a womanizer. He, he cheated on her, you know, before they were married. Uh, he cheated on her after the wedding. And that created real problems. She had said to people, and she continued to say to people, all men do this. You know, my father did this. This is just what men do. And so she wanted to suggest, I think, uh, here I'm speculating at least to a degree, although we have some evidence. uh, She wanted to believe that this would be fine, or at least this was something that, you know, just happens. But I think it was difficult for her, more difficult than maybe she thought it would be. She realized it would be. And so it's a long way of saying that I think that um, they had, they shared good times, they share a a real bond, but it was also um, a difficult time, especially I think in these early years, um, the first three, four, five years of the marriage. I guess she kind of made the best of a not so great situation. Yeah, I think so. I think that's uh, I think that's a good way of, of of putting it. And there were aspects of 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 her life uh, that she loved. Of course, she uh, I think that marrying somebody who was well off had always been quite important to her because even though she was from a she grew up in a privileged environment, money was often tight in the in the Bouvier uh, household. And so, you know, she appreciated that. She loved his sense of humor. She loved, they shared a kind of absurdist sense of humor. They had a sense of irony, both of them. Both of them liked books. So they were attracted to the written word. Um, And uh, she thought he was really handsome. He thought she was beautiful. Um, They were proud in that sense of one another. But I think you're right. I think she made the best of, of of an often difficult situation she didn't really care for politics or for the political life. Uh, she had to make peace with that as well because he was a very ambitious politician. And he made clear to her, I'm a very ambitious politician. Uh, that's what she had to confront. So 1953, they're married, September 1953. Then yeah. comes 1954. This becomes a difficult year for him. Why? Yeah. Yeah, it becomes his, uh, you know, Annas Horribilis, I guess you could say. It becomes his really terrible year. Um, Two reasons in particular, I think. One is health-related. His health deteriorates quite drastically. And in fact, ultimately, in late 54, he undergoes a very risky operation in New York City that almost kills him. 
Well, he's, he's at death's door uh, in the wake of it. It's a back operation, really. But it's a risky one. Many doctors say, don't do this, uh, Senator Kennedy. You might not survive. His parents don't want him to do it. Jackie doesn't want him to do it. But he does it. Um, because he does not want to have a life, he says, in which he's immobilized or maybe always on crutches. So part of the reason for this terrible year is that he's, he's in terrible physical condition, and the latter part of the year is basically lost uh, in preparation for the operation, the operation itself, and then the convalescence <clears throat> is, is really difficult for him, and I write about that. The second reason why 54 is so difficult for him, I think, is... Um, because of the notorious Joe McCarthy. Uh, there, we were undergoing in the United States in these years a kind of second Red Scare. The first uh, was following uh, World War I, but this is a, a kind of anti-communist um, um, it's an anti-communist era in which um, uh, suspected radicals Leftists are uh, hounded, often out of government, uh, out of uh, uh, service, uh, out of corporations, from teaching positions and so forth. And the most notorious red baiter is Joe McCarthy, senator from Wisconsin. And Jack Kennedy has to figure out from early on, from 1950 right through now, 1954, how do I respond to Joe, Joe McCarthy? And it's a really interesting part of the story because it turns out that McCarthy, also Irish Catholic, is close to Joe Kennedy Sr. He's close to Robert Kennedy, the younger brother. We haven't talked about him. And so Jack partly has to navigate this because of concerns about how the family will respond. And second, uh, Massachusetts has a lot of Irish Catholic voters who are devoted to McCarthy. Uh, and he doesn't, Jack doesn't want to alienate those Irish Catholic voters. The consequence of this is that he treads very carefully. Uh, and much to the frustration of liberals in the Democratic Party. And Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's widow, who's a force in the party, much to their frustration, JFK, you know, he bobs and weaves. He, he doesn't really want to condemn McCarthy. He doesn't support him either. Um, but it causes problems for him in 1954 and... Uh, threatens ultimately, I think, to to have real consequences for his for his future within the Democratic Party. I think it's fair to say. But this doesn't all go too badly, because the Democratic Convention in fifty six is the turning mm. point for him, isn't it? Uh, it? It's just a it's just an amazing uh, chapter in all of this, um, and it's where this vol first volume basically concludes, um, which we can discuss, but. <clears throat> You're quite right. He is not a particularly well-known figure nationally prior to the Democratic National Convention of 1956. Activists know who he is. Sort of political junkies know who he is. Um, he's a respected junior senator um, from the state of Massachusetts. He's handsome. He's charismatic. He has this war record. You know, people, some people know about him. But it's as a consequence of this convention. And it's in particular, a consequence of a decision that the nominee made, Adelaide Stevenson made a very dramatic uh, decision, which was to open up to the convention the selection of the vice presidential pick. Normally, a presidential nominee would just decide himself, uh, here's who I'm going to have. But he decided, no, the delegates are going to select the, the vice president on, pre presidential nominee. And so you have this very uh, dramatic contest in which Jack Kennedy enters this contest, almost wins this nomination, comes a very close second. And I write about this. But the important part of all this, as I think you're suggesting, is that because this is televised, and because the whole country sees the drama of the convention, you have an, a new star in the Democratic Party who just, you know, bursts forth on the scene, uh, and that is John F. Kennedy. And I think it's critical. It's it's important actually that he's not selected for the slot because the the the, the, the ticket goes down to a to a humiliating defeat in November. Uh, but 
he becomes a kind of household name. He instantly becomes a potential candidate, if not for president in 1960, then at least vice president in 1960. Uh, and he's, you could say he's on his way. And this is where you st- stop the book. My question is, why did you stop it right at this critical moment? Well, I mean, this is, this is a good question. Uh, and we face when we, you know, I, I wasn't intending for this to be a two volume work. Uh, this was going to be a big fat one volume book, but the material on the early years were, was both so rich. I, I haven't mentioned today that the, the archives are so deep uh, and the stuff that's available, maybe especially here at the Kennedy Library uh, in Boston, so good that I decided I needed to devote more time to those early years. But the point is, it was going to be a, a one volume work. And then I, when I decided, along with my editors, that we were going to do this in two volumes, the question becomes, as you say, where do we, where do we uh, split it? It made sense to me to split it here because in late 1956, so now we're moving forward just a few months to Thanksgiving, November 1956 in Hyannisport, which was the family compound, uh, not far from Boston, on the, on the ocean. <clears throat> in that Thanksgiving celebration, always a big deal in the Kennedy household, Jack Kennedy and, and his father, after dinner, have a conversation about what to do next. Um, and it's there, I suggest, and this is where the book ends, that they basically decide, Jack decides, but with his father's support, I'm running for president in 1960. So it seemed to me a good place to stop. It's a a kind of dramatic uh, point, I believe. And what it does is it sets up the second volume, uh, which I'm now working on, and which will cover, the first volume covers 39 years. This second one will only cover seven because he's assassinated in late 1963. But I believe, I hope, that it's now set up so that the next volume, the second one, can cover this long and I think um, absorbing, fascinating campaign to win the presidency in 1960, which he does barely beating Richard Nixon. It can all <clears throat> it can also then excuse me cover the presidency itself, his thousand days in the White House. And then, of course, um, and the and the the marriage. Uh, they start. They have a family, of course, two children, um, uh, civil rights, Vietnam, Cuban Missile Crisis, lots of important policy issues, the Cold War, uh, and relations with the Soviet Union, etc. And then, culminating in the terrible uh, events uh, in Dallas uh, in November of 1960. I really need to add here that the fi- I'm not going to reveal what the final sentence is because people need to go out and buy the book themselves. <laughs> I love the final sentence. Mm. When I looked at it and I went, no, really? <laughs> I, was, I need to now carry on with this. And you've left basically on a cliffhanger, like on a, on a TV series. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know what that sentence is, go and get the book. <laughs> You know, it's I, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say it. I almost was going to articulate the sentence and I thought, no, I can't do that here. So thank no, you for that. No, uh, let, let people find out what the sentence is because it's such a clever sentence and I love it. And it just rounds it off, but also leaves it on a cliffhanger and you're sitting there going, no, I need to know more now. Thank you so yeah. much. So I'm going to guess everybody who's got this book now is going to think, oh, come on, get the other edition out. We need to now know more. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I can. I, I'm a little stymied because the archives are closed on account of the pandemic, but I'm really excited about this. I'm, I'm able to do research of a, of a type anyway. And once those archives reopen, including, by the way, uh, you know, it's going to be not just in American archives, but I'm keen to get to Britain uh, because the relationship between the United States and Britain is very important in the Kennedy administration. So I want to get to the to Kew Gardens, to the National Archives there, and to other archives. I want to go to to Paris, because Jack and Jackie traveled to Paris in 1961, so I'd like to see what the French government thought. Um, lots of fun stuff to do. And and are you going to include the Berlin incident? Oh, yes. Uh, and, um, you know, Berlin, it's interesting, I'll just say this quickly, Berlin is a kind of, I don't know what to call it, it's the kind of thread Uh, maybe for lack of a better word, in both volumes. Because as you may recall, 
the preface to the first volume opens in Berlin. Um, and he visits Berlin at various points thereafter, <laughs> thereafter in, in volume one. And then in, in volume two, it's still important. It's a focal point of the Cold War. Mm. And he gives that extraordinary speech uh, just a few months before his death in Berlin in 1963, which I'm going to write about. So uh, the, German, uh, the German city is, um, is going to pop up in important, um, important moments in both books, both volumes. Fantastic. Could you just before we finish, uh, could you remind our readers the name of your book and where they can get it? So the book is called, um, well, the American, the American title is JFK Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956, available at, uh, you know, reputable bookstores and, of course, uh, online, Amazon and elsewhere uh, in Britain and I think in certain international, other international uh, markets. The title is simply JFK Volume 1. 1917 to 1956 so they made it a shorter uh, shorter um, title i think i prefer the american version there <laughs> <laughs> don't tell your publishers that but my lips are sealed <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us that was absolutely excellent and we well, you... a very brief you... overview of this because there's so much more in your book that that you haven't even touched on especially mm. during the second world war i think you devoted what was it four chapters to the second world war I think it's probably about, well, there's a section called wartime. The book is divided into three parts and the part two, which is wartime, I think it might even be six chapters. So no, yeah, there's no. a lot, there's a lot there. You're so kind to have me on. It's been wonderful to, 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 to chat with you. Thank you so much. Take care. Join us on Monday when we will be joined by David O'Keefe, who will be talking all about Dieppe. Really interesting aspects of World War II, essentially the precursor to D-Day on a beach that was all wrong. So don't miss out on that one. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.